So let's start right here. Okay. Um, okay. So um, a little a little trick that we have with um, with drawing um, the figure is to view um, the figure. So uh, going back to this idea that of geometric essence, where yes. we don't draw we don't draw what we see, but we draw what we understand. And then when you understand, you can see better. Um, yes, I, told, I, I that's one of the biggest pluses for me. I understand where the abductor group is, and how the Sartorius divides the abductor group. And yep. so I'm looking for I'm looking for those things. Yeah, definitely. You, I could see that you are. And then the um, the the whole idea of um, so the whole idea of having a cylinder, which we can see right here. A cylinder advance towards the viewer. So yes. if you look, if you look at your um, your drawing right here, um, the cylinder of the leg is advancing towards us yes. right here, yep. which would um, which would mean you know what? Actually, I want to draw this on top. I'm going to do a new layer. Um, so the cylinder advancing towards us. Right here, there's a sphere for the right. patella, and then there's a cylinder retreating away. Yeah, just right here. We're just gonna pretend it's just that simple right now. Now, if you look at that um, dead on, as we're looking at it at the moment, um, the foreshortening is very hard to to tell. It's hard to see what's going on because we have this going on one dot one. Like yeah. it's just it's very flat. So what they would do in the Renaissance and the Baroque um, all through the centuries is knowledgeable artists would say, okay, well, if it's true that let's say we, we, the light that they have is coming directly from the side, um, that's a really bad call on behalf of the writers of this book, like an extremely bad call, because there's no way that you could differentiate between this plane and this plane if they're both just side lit. Gotcha. It's, it's a really bad call. So um, that's where like, you know, I take what I can from books, but I also look at them and I say like, you know, they, sometimes these people, like, especially someone who's just writing for the sake of like sculpture, um, they could not realize what my friend Jason Arkles, the uh, sculptor realizes. Like he says, when you sculpt, you're still sculpting by light. You're not sculpting just by form alone because sculpture is about light falling on the form. Um, sure. So what you really need to do is if you look at um, the figure right here is you need to send the whole lower half of the figure uh, okay. of the. Yeah, sure. Back sure, away. That's... Yep. And so now you're implying that the light is, is coming from here and that that is going away and so that that becomes much easier to um to communicate to your viewer so half of what you're dealing with right there so you could still have your shadow right here right yeah. um but and then you could obviously you would go into the specifics of the anatomy on the patella but you could then if you want you could have a tiny little like glint of light like up at the up at the corner at the top of the gastrocnemius, the lateral portion, you could have a little bit of light right here because obviously let's let's reduce um, this lower leg. Let's uh, think of another uh, concept for it, and let's say that it's an upside down bowling pin. That's a, a common conception that artists will have. Um, so if it's an upside down bowling pin, um, the light will in fact, fall on the lower end of it if light is coming from overhead, such as the arrow indicates. And so there will be a bit of light right here. You know what I mean? Well, you can see in the photograph, you, it, what you, you, that principle you can see in the photograph is just that when you emphasize it, whoa, what a difference. Yeah, like they do yeah, have, yeah. in the photograph, they do have, the, the light is kind of coming from here and you can see that you can see the lower leg the is head. definitely oh. darker than the upper upper leg. You can see a, a little, yep, a little bit. But I, that's where, like, anytime I look at 
um, anytime I look at anything in nature or a photograph, um, I say to myself, did this image that's being presented to me, um, did this, is this person who's in this studio, is this lighting, does it suit the purposes of my, of my two dimensional image that I'm, you know, attempting to make three dimensional. Right. More often than not, the answer to that is no. Um, that's where the lesson is that we have to design what we choose to see. Um, so you could, you could say like, well, the light here, it, it is a little bit darker here than here, but you know what? Um, not close enough. Um, that's where I think if they were more aware and I'm not looking for an occasion to be, um, overly critical of, of them because I think oh, they've done a good job in this book, but, um, that is way more useful to a yeah, painter. What you just did, darkening that, I mean, that's amazing. That is just yeah. amazing how the leg, now the leg uh, comes toward, lower leg is coming forward and the back, uh, upper femur is, is in behind, amazing. Yeah, it's, it's there, like, it, it's just there, I just didn't know what to emphasize. It really, really yeah, like, it's, it it's this whole idea of like us approaching nature with us approaching anything we're depicting with our preconceived notions like yes. preconceived notions are like an evil um it's an evil cliche <laughs> that the modernists would have but guess what the artists for centuries like if you go through i'm just going to pull up um some random images like painting woman um let's see let's see what Bugro does i bet you we see this a few times and i'm not even thinking of anything here specifically but I bet you, Mark, that when we look at the Venus, that the back, the, the leg, look at it. Yeah. See that? Oh, my God. See how, much, <laughs> see how much darker it is? Sure. And that's the way that, because he had the problem where you have that frontal view where it's a straight to a straight. And so he sends much more light from overhead, ambient overhead, on the upper thigh, and it shifts suddenly at the lower leg, and then there's light on the foot. And that's, yes. that's what, Amazing. and I mean, some artists, we could go to other artists, but you know, I, I don't think it's necessary, but we could go to other artists and say, um, okay, Caravaggio did this with, um, you know, at the supper of Emmaus or like whatever it might be, but we don't need to, because right here we can see, look at the compression, look at the value of the upper, um, like just the upper leg in general and the lower leg in general they're only off by a few degrees in terms yeah. of like value, but it's enough. It's sufficient where it turns the form perfectly for like uh, a painting that's just suffused with light. Do you know what I mean? You also notice that below her umbilicus above the, it is darkened as well. And that gives it almost a shelf. Gives, it gives it depth, pulls it back. That's and exactly it, right. The, the, yep. Bring up her skin again. I'll show you something else. that's really interesting. You see the, can you appreciate the lacy pattern on her legs? You almost see the little blue veins that she's got. In, totally. in medicine, yeah, that's a, a condition called libido reticularis. Um, mm -hmm. We see an autoimmune disease all the time, but how the hell did he paint that? <laughs> it's just amazing. How he, it's amazing. It's so amazing. you can see the blue. You can see, you can the, see blue. the blue. You can see the blue. Wow. And yeah. it's like, so I'm not, I'm not really like, I have, friends who like adore Bouguereau and like there are quite a number of new collectors out there who feel that Bouguereau is the greatest painter who ever lived like I, I'm not I'm not in their, wow. I'm not in their company but I admire the craft I admire the artist you know what I mean yeah. like yeah. um yeah. consummate craftsman um and I used him because he's so um he's such an academic artist and that's not a negative word. Academic has no. become a, a dirty word. He's yes. such an academic artist that he, he illustrates these principles so perfectly. Um, but you could jump over to another painter. Um, if you want, what I'll do is I will um, send that image. You know what? I'll just send this whole page to you. Thank you. Appreciate um, it. I'll text it to you if you'd like. Um, right. Then let's pull up uh, Proudhon. So Proudhon... Um, he had these preconceived um, conventions before he even saw the model. You know what I mean? Right. Um, so it's really important for us to dwell on this. Upper leg, 
lower leg. You know what I yep. mean? Yeah, I see it again. I see it again. Yes. And you can just go through his entire uh, corpus and you can just see again and again how he separates the one chapter. Like I regard um, lengths of an appendage, I regard them as being chapters in a book or okay. what we, you know, what in music we call phrases. So sure. you have your phraseology where if you play a piece and the pianissimo is not quiet, but it's, you know, it's in the middle. The fortes are not loud, but they're in the middle. It flattens the whole composition. You've lost the musical idea. And it's the same thing with, with um, uh, figure drawing. It's totally the same thing where if you want to understand what Proudhon is doing with the neoclassical artists we're doing, it doesn't matter which period. I don't even need to list specific periods. You have to understand that they had conventions that they approached the figure with before the figure ever even got up and posed, you right. know? So hopping back to your uh, piece, um, can you still hear me? I am fine. I'm fine. Oh, cool. So I know that Zoom has bounced me because my screen goes blank. <laughs> um, <laughs> so um, I'm going to uh, now hide um, what I just drew on right here. I'm going to hide that. And let's jump back into the drawing. So what I would say is I think you could push the whole register of this. Yeah. Um, we can go quite a bit darker. And again, really overriding nature. And then over here, maybe not so dark, but uniformly uh, like a mid-tone. So just gonna go kind of uniform mid-tone, but I'm gonna make the, the leg that's, let's call this uh, leg right here. Let's say that this leg, whoops, I'm on the wall there. Um, this leg is, is advancing and this one is retreating. And this one's just kind of like right in the middle. Right. You know what I mean? It's just a, a, an up, yeah. up and down. So if that's the case, that this one is just kind of like right in the middle, um, then we can, we can shade it accordingly and just kind of go like this. Yeah. So now this leg feels up, up and down vertical. And this leg over here feels like it's retreating. And I might go even a little bit darker right here to show that it's retreating. And then what I might do over here, I'm going to keep that light, but I'm going to even, um, there's this whole idea in drawing where um, I, I think at times we've talked about the 50-50 split, where if you have a cylinder um, and it's getting hit with light from right here, one of the things we want to avoid doing is the 50-50 split of shading, right? right? And so before we even start thinking of anatomy, um, we want to be sure that we're not, we're, we're not even fathoming, we're, we're not even going into the sartorius and its insertion into the aces or the, like, we're not doing any of that. Um, before we get to that, we're, we're going, we're thinking to ourselves, okay, I'm going to do two thirds light, one third shadow. Right there. Oh, see what I mean? With you. Um, or you can conversely, you can go two thirds shadow, one third light. Just like that. And that still turns the form very well, right? Um, but the one thing we want to avoid um, is the 50-50 split. So that flattens the composition, right? Just like that. And are you able to see that? Yes, I do. Oh, yes, cool. I can. Um, so, so as I look at the, the model, I, I would choose the two-thirds light, one-third shadow. Sure. And um, I, would, I would put that in. Let me just jump here. I'm going to erase this away. And there we go. All right, so that's the light source. So I'm choosing that before I even look it does feel like two-thirds one-third and I'm gonna put my I'm gonna coat over this with the whole even kind of two-thirds right here 
a little little bit of light lands right here on the far leg. Yeah. And then what I'm going to do, uh, but that light over there, I actually made too bright. I'm going to darken it down a little bit because don't forget, like this leg is, this leg right here is advancing and this leg is just up and down. So you never really want to have too much bright, bright on there, if that makes sense. It does. Um, and then running the whole entire length of the upper leg, uh, you want to put in this highlight just like that. Yeah, I did see that. And that's, that's where, um, again, in terms of phrasing, we want to, in phrasing, we want to, even where our lightest lights hit, we want to be sure that we're still only putting them in like in a midtone. Because if you look, if you look at um, the light on that leg, the only way that he could achieve, an artist could achieve the light right here, is everything around it has to be a little, a little bit darker. You know what I mean? Yep. So um, an artist who really does this extremely well is, uh, have you ever looked at Lipka? No. So Lipka is an unbelievable artist. I mean, he's like, he's, he's pretty risque uh, at times. But he's like, he's such a master at um, these liquid highlights on f like where he compresses all the midtones. Uh, let me jump back over here and pull this up. Um, he has these like liquid highlights that he, he puts on the figure that are really just incredible. Like, like this would be an example. The only way the highlight works on that arm is that the arm has to be dark. Do you know what I'm saying? Uh, it's, it's almost plastine. It's like plastic. It totally. Yep. Yeah. And so all his figures always feel like they have like this slight coat of sweat, which goes with his like kind of sensual uh, subject matter. Um, so he always, but again, it's that whole idea of compressing the flesh tone so that those liquid highlights pop right off you know is in you know egon shield is, is his influence for sure yep uh, yep i yeah. i think he would have been and actually soroya as well with his yes. soroya portraits yes. and, Cl and Cl uh, obviously clinton and shit and his influence as well wow yeah and it, so those highlights by the way I mean, you know that egon shield and clint both died in the spanish flu in 1919 you know that no i didn't i didn't know yeah. that no yeah they both died within a couple of months of each other. Shell, I think, was 33, maybe even younger. And Clint right. both succumbed in Vienna to that disease. Here we go again. So another, another example. That's crazy. I, I did yeah, not my know that. My father, my father loved the young Shell, and I have one of his big, big, uh, I wish I had the original, one of the uh, reproductions. Yeah. Oh, oh my goodness. Like, th these would oh, be excellent for you, to, for you to copy. I mean, if you were interested in copying something, he he has such mastery of tone um, yeah. in his work, and so um, jumping back to your piece, um, I would say really compress your values, even in the lights um, where there's like for instance, look at the the band right here. Sure, there's a, there's a, a dark band right here that's already half tone, and so I would even have a little bit of a half tone where the light is right there. You see how that just made yes. the forms. Oh yeah, dimension. sure. Hop right out. Yep. Um, and then I'm going to, I'm going to carve now to make room for the adductor group on the inside of the leg right here. Right. I would come a little bit more into this space where there's like, um, on the inside of the thigh right there. Um, looking, so I'm looking right, uh, whoops, I'm looking right here. Um, the inside of the thigh, let's, let's just, I'm going to hastily <laughs> put something in. That's, this right here is the great trochanter, let's say. Yeah, see um, it. So the inside of the thigh right here has this whole group that is obviously um, bisected by the sartorius. And it comes out right here before it goes back in. And um, so, you know, it is probably a good way of looking at this. Um, let's see if I can pull up my, um, my drawing 
yeah, this drone will be perfect for this. Um, wow, 142 megabytes. I do not want to open that file. No, don't do that. Um, that will crash. <laughs> um, I have I have it in saved in other formats. Let me see if I have it. Uh, 47 megabytes. We're safer there. Uh, da, 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 da. Um, okay, yeah, this is 30 megabytes. We'll be okay. Um, so let's pop this in. And I'm going to save it to photos. And let's pop this in right here. And look at that adductor group. And it's pretty easy to see it right here. Sure. You know what I mean? Oh, yep. Um, so it's that, it's that group that just sits um, yep. just like this. It's all, all anchored to the symphys pubis, on, and then it comes into the into the femur. Yep, there it is. Yep. And so you can almost, before you even see the model, you can say that there's going to be, I never really see the one, two right here. I mean, you can see that, but more so it's always a triangle um, before you get to the, this is the vest, this medialis, right? Am right. I right with that? Um, so um, I'm just going to, I'm going to move that image over so it's not blocking us. Uh, by, by the way, Anatomy for Sculpture on page 198 has a real nice example uh, of the insertion of those muscles as well as a, right next to it, a, a model picture, which may, cool. you might you can. Yeah, page really? 198. Cool. 198. Um, I'll definitely take a look at that. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Um, I would, if I were you, Mark, uh, something I would do is I would jump over and mix in um, black chalk with what you're doing because okay. what you can do right here is i'm going to go in with some black myself um what you can do right here is you can then find that group but you're going to want to kind of accent it for a moment right there do you know what i'm saying yes um and so i would find that group right there and whoops too big it's going to kind of you can actually okay. see the bulge you can see the bulge on the inner aspect of her, her thigh, it's there. Yep. Sure it's there. Yeah, totally. And then we have this long run, and then begins, you know, we have the vastus medialis, which really isn't pronounced because it's not in flexion at this point. Now we're wrapping around the underside of the head of the tibia, and then begins the gastro right there. So like you can see this like descent, you know what I mean? Yep. Um, this progression. And then you do have room to go in and bring in, you know, this nice strong shadow. Um, you do have time for that. I, I want to go a little bit darker than that. You know what I'm just going to poach right from her. Um, take her color. And there we are right there. Now you can cast the shadow on that right there. And... Hey, Kevin, excuse me for interrupting. You would use for chalk, black chalk, rather than a black Conti pastel. Uh, I don't. I don't really know. I don't play around with Conti too much. I, I should. Right. Um, and but for me, the reason why I would use black chalk is because I know it fuses with sanguine or red chalk very nicely. Uh, okay. Very good. All right. Thanks. Um, Conti always has a an an oily feel, which is not undesirable. It's just it is right. what it is. Uh, whereas chalk on chalk, they're made for each other. They, gotcha. they, they're the same. It's, you know, it's, it's not, there's, there'll be no oil and vinegar effect going okay. on there. Um, so now you see how I carved out that middle space now. So I'm working from what I know is true. I'm carving a little bit back in right here. But what I've done now is um, I've shown myself uh, which I've been waiting for for a little while, I've shown myself that the pelvic girdle, uh, given the length of the um, legs, the pelvic girdle needed to be wider. And by wider, I, I, essentially what I just mean is from point to point. Right. Just it, given the, the length of, of the figure, from point to point, it just needs to come wider. And so this is feeling that leg's feeling good. 
and that negative space begs for there to be more width, right? Because yep. before I felt like it was too, uh, too willowy. And so now it tells me that we actually want to bump out, um, making my way along at the symphysis pubis. Um, so right, I think here. And it makes sense the pelvis is tilted at that direction right there. And okay. so this is going to be, um, because it's, it's tilted um, at that angle, we understand that this is a weight a weight bearing uh, leg, right? And so the weight being, it's not, you know, it's not 100% on this leg, but the tilt, look at how much lower sure. that leg is. So it tilts down just like this. Then we have the ball of the patella. Um, but the ball of the patella also shows us that that is much lower, right? So the patella right here is way lower than that patella. This patella is way lower than that one. So um, I'm exaggerating for just for no. clarity's sake. Um, so let me go backwards. So that means that we're gonna have to move this a little bit more down here. And then there's the outside. Wow. Right there. Huh. So obviously this has to be, what I'm suggesting isn't clean. Like uh, I'm, I'm suggesting things that like, I'm like, well, it moves a little bit more like right here. But really a lot of what I'm doing is I am dropping lines and looking at that negative space. Dropping lines everywhere. So then I see all this negative space in here. And I, and I don't have enough negative space for sure. Yeah. And that, that the dynamism, the dynamic quality of this piece is found in everything rests right here on this piece. The whole piece rests on that. And it actually would be nice for us to go back to Bouguereau and see what he did. Because to tell you the truth, I don't remember. Um, <laughs> so... Um, yeah, the whole entire composition oh. rests right there for Bouguereau. Um, and Bouguereau chose to put our eye level, the horizon level, more or less, um, as I look, our horizon level is more or less at the knees. And so we don't see such a great uh, change in the height of the patella because, again, depth appears to be, if you hold a board, at eye level on the horizon, you're only going to see the side of the board. So he, we're beneath Venus, which is fitting for the subject matter. Yes. She's a god, yes. and we're immortal, so we're looking up at her. Um, Can so, we just go back? Go back to that for one second. There's an interesting, the minor point. Uh, the cherubs in behind. Tell me that's not uh, Bo. Bar that's not Bo Bartley. It is is nudes. You see? Oh yeah, the, yeah. Obvi yeah, obviously. Totally. It's funny how the how the artist I mean, you could speak to this how you you know who are your influences and I mean good God that's it look at that totally these yeah. artists I mean there's there's I, I read an interesting article um, uh, on, just on representational painting in general and it was just talking about the quiet subversion the quietly subversive uh, representational art movement the author of the article is. T disparaging i mean he was trashing it but he he didn't deny that it was and that it's there's this quiet almost yeah you know, descent <laughs> um <laughs> taking place where a lot of artists of my ilk are just bypassing um a lot of the tenets the central tenets of the past century and going back to 19th century art and rewind and bo bartlett is 100 percent of that you yeah. know of that grouping um, where he's looking at, he's probably looking at Bouguereau. His color palette is sometimes, in my opinion, it looks like French neoclassical. Sure. So, yeah. This is late 19th century. He, uh, Bouguereau died in like the early early 19th century. Yep. Yep. 1890 or whatever. Yeah. He, I forget. Let's uh, look here. Um, he was doing this during the French Impressionists. Yeah. He was like, the French Impressionists thought he was the real deal and they were going to be 
you know, the stragglers as far as history is concerned. <laughs> Nobody yeah. knew that Bouguereau was going to disappear into obscurity and that Cezanne was going to be ascendant. Um, yeah. I mean, in, in kind of a funny side note, uh, I'm okay with that. I like Cezanne a million times more. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, um, okay, so I'll let you play with the implications of oh, yeah. out that that leg on the right. But I think um, the next thing that's important for us is the um, – is the foot where as we, as we come down right here to the foot, we, we want to um, think of the hinge point. We want to build this foot. And so as I'm looking at this foot, um, I think it would be an excellent ex uh, exercise for you to really get in close here. I, I've kind of uh, damaged the photo because I've been airbrushing on top of it. Right. <clears throat> But um, well, I have the book. I, I have the book. No pro problem. They have a whole section on feet, so that's something that I will work on for sure. Exactly. Yeah. So you, you'll be you'll be good to go there. And what I would say is, just get that book out um, to the extent that you can get in close, and do a study of the lower, the lower leg, as it inserts. So obviously, we have the tibia, and it's right. coming in like this fibula out here um so you know all this but i you know it's it's no, all okay. worth like uh verbalizing so then this is merely the the distal head of the fibula the ankle yep yep this right here is simply the distal head of the tibia right and then we have we have them I, i'm not going to go too much into the uh structure of the lower leg kind of want to talk more about the calcaneus and so how the calcaneus um let me i want to do this drawing i don't want it to be overpowered give me just one second to figure out what's going on with the layers you know what? i can just move my layer okay um here we are okay move over <laughs> all right there we go um so the calcaneus is just peeking out from behind right there yep and then we have um, what we what we will just sum up all of the phalanges of the toes. We can just sum them up as being kind of like spread out like this, right? Yep. And um, I'm skipping. Obviously, I'm skipping a whole lot of anatomy here, but it's not it's not always productive to go bone by bone um, into every possible position. I'm not saying that we shouldn't know it, but um, to, in studying, you know, in studying like the hands and studying the feet, um, it's very useful for us to reduce. And so I reduce the upper portion of the, really, the, the, I, they're not the carpal bones, obviously, but they're the, let's use the hand anatomy. So the carpal bones um, right there. And um, just reduce that upper plane. And then we have our lower plane right here. Sure. When it comes out. Um, on the side, we are viewing, uh, we can't even see the calcaneus over here, but we do have the fatty pad on the side of the calcaneus. Yeah. Right. And then the fatty pad that comes off of these bones right here. Um, so like I I'm trying to, as best I can, like, what I see in Michelangelo's uh, drawing of the Libyan Sibyl, um, I'm really trying to do my best to think in terms of groupings, like very much in terms of oh, okay. uh, grouping. So you do the same thing with the hands. You yeah. Know, the, you know, right. The metacarpals and then the carpals and the phalanges, all different groups. Yep. And so for here, like the whole entire, um, you know, the grouping, the navicular bone, the cuneiform bone, we, right. we don't want to yeah. do that. We just want to see this. We just want to see an upper plane. And then right here, metatarsals, just right. lump them all together. Um, and then once we've locked those in, then and only then do we want to think in terms of the final length of the phalanges. So right here. And we can group all of these into one massing as well just like that. See that? And then yep. we, we have our final, let's just call it the thumb. So like it's useful to think of the big toe as being the thumb 
because then we treat it independently like we do in the hands and we should treat it independently when it comes to the feet. So I can see by what I did, uh, the reason why it's great to go into general, um, general bones and to not get too caught up in the specifics is I can see that I placed my thumb toe too far over and it doesn't ever break the external contour if you drop a vertical down. Um, it doesn't ever break the external contour here. Do you see what I mean? Yes, it and is. I, had, I had mine all the way out there, which means the toe would have been like right there. Um, so I am going to shimmy it and say, okay, I want to see the front of this. I like thinking of the ends, the fatty pads, whatever you want to call them, um, of the phalanges. I like seeing them as being cubes when I'm laying them in. I'm, I'm, there are different schools of thought on this, and one is as valid as the other. I just like the ends of a cube because I can, I can chew on that. <laughs> um, <laughs> I can't really see the end of a, uh, of a sphere as easily as I can the end of a cube, if that makes sense. Sure. So if you hold a tennis ball at me, I can't really place it in the same way if you hold a box of cereal. I can see the end of that. Um, okay, so then that would be my study of the feet. Now, we've already talked about the lighting, and the reason why this is, um, this is so important, right here, let me see where my drawing exists. It exists right here, okay. Uh, so watch this. What I'm going to do is, whoops, I'm gonna do freehand. Okay, you come with me over here. Whoops. It's only giving me half the drawing. I must have, must have swapped layers. Uh, just bear with me for sure. one second while I try to discern <laughs> where this is. And let's merge, merge down. I wanna transport this over. There we go, perfect. So now I have that right there. Cool, that actually feels good. Um, okay, so now I have this moved over and I have my little study transported over here. Um, we've already talked about sending this whole leg away, right? So, so now that we've sent that whole leg away, right here, um, we want to return. This is going to receive light again. And there's gonna be a really bright bright on the toe because if the light's coming in at this angle, sure. you're gonna get kapow right there. A whole lot of light on the upper register of those toes and probably on the inside of that toe. It'll be on the upper side of really what we're seeing. We're, we're seeing this faintest glimmer of the calcaneus right there. We're seeing the distal head of the fibula right there, the lateral distal portion. And then up, up here, the fibula, right here would be receiving a strong light right there. Um, right there, we have it. We have locked in um, the cascade of light and look at how well that turns. Oh, sure. You know what I mean? And so um, that's what we wanna do. We wanna, we wanna separate um, the geometric ideas. We wanna separate them all into their most basic forms so that we're thinking in terms of geometric essence and not at all thinking in terms of, um, you know, we, we don't wanna go into verisimilitude where we're trying to make a drawing look like a photo, um, but we wanna be in command of our craft and we wanna, we wanna look at our um, form and say, I choose to see this on top of you. And yeah, that's yeah, did you put the um, um, I want to show you what I've done as I've drawn along with you and I made some improvements. Can, I want to show it to you. Can yeah, you just turn, uh, you can either text or you can uh, email it over and then I'll open no, it. No, no, just right here. turn on the camera so you can see me. Can you see me now? Oh, so you want to hold it up? Cool. Yeah, me. Um, I can see you. Yep, that's cool. 
Yeah, there it is. Uh, which one we improve? This one. This one. Yep. It's, ama it's amazing. You know, just a quick little change. I mean, it's obviously more work, but that trick with the charcoal, I've never really, I have plenty of the fried and nitrum uh, charcoal. Yep. It, it really, really enhanced the photograph. Or the yeah, photograph. that's where, the, uh, that's where a, lot of, a lot of drawings that you see, like, if you go on the Metropolitan Museum's website, um, and you look at um, their, they, they always list the materials. They say, you know, drawing by, uh, I don't care who it is. I keep on using Michelangelo because I, I look at his drawing so much. Uh, but they say sanguine red chalk with black chalk with touches of white chalk. Right. Um, so what's amazing to me, if you look at this book on uh, the fundamentals of drawing by Mogoletza. Okay. okay. Uh, so if you look at this, um, his opening statement on drawing a figure, it's so cool. And it's very, to me, it's very un-American. <laughs> <because, laughs> well, we, we uh, it, I, I'm, I'm throwing myself under the bus here. I, I had this John Wayne approach to drawing and painting. And I talk about this a lot. You've heard me say it. Where it was this thing of like, you know, you know, give me a, a number two pencil and I'll, I'll take over the world. Like, um, <laughs> and then you talk to the Russians, you talk to the Europeans and they're like, you could draw with a number two pencil or you could use the materials that have been honed for centuries by people who were much better than you. Or or you could, you know, be <laughs> dumb dumb kind of blue collar, Kevin. Well so, yeah, well the thing is you could you could think John Wayne makes some decent movies and then you can watch some Academy Award winners and see the difference. Yeah, and it's like I, I'm forever fighting off the blue collar tendencies that I was raised with mm -hmm. and where it's this thing of like, ah, I'll do it myself, man. And then somebody comes to me and says, like, yes, you could. Or <laughs> or <laughs> Or you could look at how it was done for centuries. Um, and it's like, oh yeah, so I have to fight off that American uh, uh, leaning. It, you know, it's our blessing and it's our curse. So it's, yes. it's not one thing or the other. It's um, true. So what I would say, um, I don't like, you know, like we, j jumping over to your other pieces, the principle that we've used here can be applied everywhere. Yes, and I see it now, I'll, I'll go back. Oh, there's a, this one on the on the left. I got her. I think I've got her a little white. Yeah, I think I've got did a little better job with it. This thing yeah. I struggled. With, this is a whole week's work. Uh, uh, it was this fun one on the left. Yeah, right here. Yeah. And that's well, that's full size, by the way. That's twenty four by thirteen, with exactly right. this. Yeah, I, this is the first time I've ever done anything of that size. Yep. Well, so he, can I make a recommendation to you? Yes. Um, so. This is a really interesting thing that I picked up in my own work. And then after I picked up on it in my own work, um, I heard it from other sources, which is interesting. Um, the best figure drawings are drawings of the model from behind, where you can't see the face. And so I picked up on it in my own work. I was like, wow, I just did this great drawing of someone's back. And then the model turns towards me, and it's a drawing of, it's a portrait drawing with a body. Right. And oh. We, we all have to fight that. So if, if I go like this, watch this, ready? Everything is really locking in really strong. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then I go like that and there's a mismatch between the head and the body, but yeah. that's not cause for despair. My recommendation to you is this. I would get your blending stump out, spend the rest of the time, in, in another segment of time. I don't, I don't want to, you know, prescribe specific time frames. Right. Spend a significant portion of time asking yourself um, what is soft and what is sharp, um, even including that cast shadow. What is soft, what is sharp? And then once you've really asked those questions, um, go in with a blending stump and go in with your Alvin automatic pencil. I got um, it. And you can even get with the Alvin automatic pencil, that's a sharp pencil, but I even get a piece of sandpaper and I sharpen the, the lead really? in an automatic pencil to get wow. it super sharp. Um, and that's where you're going to, um, I'll pull up this drawing that I did uh, just the other day of my son, Liam. You can see how much I'm using the automatic pencil and the blending stump. You know what I mean? Yes. And uh, for some reason, this isn't downloading. It's pixelated. Um, 
I'm seeing it perfectly on my end. Cool. Well, it's like, it's this soft, sharp dialogue. And I'm, I myself in this, I'm really looking at Soroya a lot. And I'm studying because the way that a cast shadow, cast shadows um, with direct light are incredibly sharp. So the light cutting across his upper chest is incredibly sharp. But light flowing over the soft, let's say the semi-spherical, semi-cubical form of the upper pectoral, that's a soft flow over form. Sure. You know what I mean? Yes. Um, so that's that. That's that play that um, I'm I'm jumping around with right there, where I'm flitting back and forth, and it doesn't. It bears. Um, it really, uh, I think, comes out best in uh, the distance. Under close scrutiny, it starts to like break down a little bit, but when you look at it from afar, um, that's where I feel like you can understand it the best. You know what I mean? Sure. And um, again, one of the things I'm really looking at a lot is I myself am studying Soroya and looking at his softs and sharps. It's a very sharp uh, shadow shape. This is, oil. This is oil. we're looking at oil, oil paint here. Yep, this is a Soroya oil paint, yep. And then like, some real look at that sharp sharp cast shadow from the basket yep. hand um but then look at some really gentle transitions all through here reflected light with gentle transitions everywhere nice. you know what i mean on the yep. form oh, perfect yeah that's a master so th that's a, that's a game of direct light but you as you're doing this i would ignore the head i would even actually say you can rub the head out and when you and I come back, um, if you want, we can go into the head. Um, I bet you you'll see the head better when, sure. when you ignore the head. So that's something I was taught all the time in my drawing career, where it was just like, uh, just ignore the head for a while. Treat it as being just a geometric box. Right. Like, turn it, turn it into a Luca Cambiasso box. <laughs> where it's just nothing but like nothing but that and you'll probably come up with a more accurate head um if you treat it like that you see what i mean right. and i'm not even saying the shape is right because now i can see i gotta cut that right there but again just pure geometry and then focus right here on what is soft and what is sharp what is the brightest bright what is the half tone just like we were talking about on the other drawing so, um, and everything is going to apply over to these two studies because the nice thing is you have, you have nice drawings here to work into. Um, and that's all you want to do is take the same theme and literally just transport the same theme. Okay. Here is the leg right here. We have the Achilles, right? Yeah. We have, we have the Achilles, uh, cavity. I don't even know if it's called the Achilles cavity. I call it that um, right yeah. here. Um, then we have the beginning of the calcaneus. The calcaneus is actually a pretty actually it's called the it's the bursa it's the bursa sac. So it's the Achilles bursa would be the pro proper term, I guess. The Achilles bursa, cool. Yeah. Um, what's Latin, the Latin right? bursa means bursa means sac in Latin. So we, mm -hmm. the purpose. Interestingly, I just can't help but practice medicine. The purpose of the bursa is to protect the um, tendon that's overlying the bone. It's a lubrication point. And we have so, the, over the trochanthic bursa, we have the you know, gluteal muscles inserting there. But right underneath that they insert is a bursa because it's an area that the bone could literally rub through the tendon. So who are, who, the design team put in these uh, grease points. <laughs> that wait, uh, can you, we, can we, you explain we actually that? have. Say again? Can you explain that again? So the that actual little concavity in there that little area yeah. on the inside if you, if you were to dissect it open you would find this gelatinous material in there called glucuronic wow. acid it's a, it's a lubricant we have these lubricant areas throughout every joint in our body has glucuronic acid which is allows our our um joints to move effortlessly but it can you can get inflammation in there and then subsequently you can get a use of a, a, a um, achilles bursitis so you get a lot of pain and swelling at that at that area uh, Mark, that is absolutely fascinating. You taught me something I've never heard yeah. read anywhere <laughs> in my life. 
as Kevin, absolutely you, come to my o- you, you want to learn this. You come to my office. We'll practice medicine for a day. I'll put a white coat on you. Doesn't matter who you are. And I'll show <laughs> you, I'll, I'll show you diseases. And you know, most of my practice is soft tissue. I'll look at this. I'll take my hand and squeeze something and know that there's a bursa there. And I say, well, you have wow. a first sign. Or rotator, the classic one is rotator cuff tear. And yeah. I, there is examination. I mean, you and as an, an anatomist, uh, anatomically will recognize, oh, yeah, that's, of course, that's where that you should have pain. That's where those muscles insert. And I, my, the rest of medical, and then you start seeing all kinds of asymmetry and atrophy of muscles that you, because you know they're there, particularly in low yeah. back pain. Low back pain wow. is amazing. You'll have someone stand up, turn around, and you'll see the QL muscles are in spasm, and the whole torso is, is tilted. Um, that's it, a mar- that's a Margaret. Yeah, it's a, it's a lost art. You know, nowadays you go to a doctor, oh, you need an MRI, go to physical therapy. No one touches the patient. No one examines the patient. No one talks to the patient. And I explain, I'll sit, take my time and explain, this is, it's not that you have a ruptured disc. You have a muscle that's in spasm. And I'll demonstrate that to you. It's just, uh, it's, it's very frustrating in this day and age of that technology is an excuse for not practicing medicine. It's just awful, awful. Medicine. That's uh, crazy, Mark. Yeah, 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 I have, I can go on for hours about getting people with bad knees and no one's examined them and they have a bad hip. Because hip pain can be, a bad hip can go into the, can present as a bad knee. But, and no, yeah. orthopedic surgeons, not touching the patient, not having them take their clothing off. Oh my goodness. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's, it's, you got me, you got me going on something that's, it's very frustrating because I have a lot of young physicians. It's one of the reasons I have those young physicians in my office is to make a difference and say to them, well, what do you see? What do you examine? Which, by the way, leads me into another subject. I'd love to publish a book on surface anatomy for, for, for physicians. Maybe yeah. something you would like to, we could have a wonderful collaboration. And, That's uh, so neat. <laughs> yeah, and make a lot of money because that book does not exist. I, yeah. I, I, when I and see you next in person, I have a lot of a basic how to examine the patient books, but no one has ever said, well, show me where the greater trochanter is. Tell me what inserts on the greater trochanter. And or, you know, this is the type of thing that for a physician who's, and, and all physicians who are doing primary care, not only nurse practitioners, PAs, they look, but they don't see. Just like, you know, yeah. I've said it a million times, you teach the blind to see, Kevin. I mean, they are really blind. Uh, that, they really, so they just, yeah, just amazed. They're amazed. They're amazed. They, they look at me and say, how the hell did you know that? I said, well, it's right there. It's right there. And, yeah. uh, Something like that would be, it would be fairly easy for us to do. Um, and I think it, it's worthy of, of uh, talking about it maybe in the future when you have a free moment. Yeah, well, I mean, that, that is really interesting because uh, like just that whole idea of the bursa right there, the, the lubricant in that area, um, understanding function yep. influences form, yep. Yep. right? Yep. So, and then when we're drawing and painting, um, the difference and we were talking about like, well, this is a perfect example. You and I were talking about the hand of God and Adam. And, sure. you know, we were, we were both like kind of saying the same thing where it was just like, man, there's an element of lassitude, but also helplessness, but God is reaching. Well, how is that conveyed by muscle groups <laughs> in <Yes>. skeletal structure? <laughs> exactly um, right. So it's all about, uh, one of my teachers in Italy said it best. He said, drawing and painting, is acquiring a visual vocabulary so that you can go out and talk. It's beautiful. I love that. It was so beautiful. And I I never thought of it that way before. And then Robert Beverly Hale, subsequently, I I realized that he says the same exact thing, you know? Nice. So, um, yeah, so you're, you're, everything you're, that I'm looking at, um, you are set up for refining these drawings. Um, you could even go in, Mark, with a little bit of graphite and see if it's agreeable, like a, a 2B. Sometimes uh, graphite and chalk um, are married together perfectly. Oh, I um, thought of doing that. Nice. But sometimes it depends on the paper. They can, they can look, uh, the graphite can look shiny, and the chalk is obviously very matted, and it can be nasty as anything. So um, whatever gets the sharpest kind of like a gray to a velvety black without going jet black. Um, and then you really just want to have, I like graphite because it can get so sharp. And then you can find like 
um, I think that's the tibialis anterior um, uh, tendon inserting around right here. You can right. carve out, okay, why is there right there? Why is there that, hard, that diagonal line before we begin the ascent of really what here is characterized by bone? Why? Um, and I drew my foot too big on purpose, just to like zoom in. The whole entire thing that I drew right there um, should really be probably, let me just draw this quick, should really be uh, that big. Um, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, but I just wanted to like kind of outline for you, um, you know, the, how you can take what you have and go into specifics. And it is literally with everything you're looking at here, um, you'll be able to do that. So I think that would be great work between this week and next. Um, I'd pull up, if I were you, I'd pull up the, um, this is distracting me right here. I have to erase this away. <laughs> I can't okay. send this off to you with that big cutaway. <laughs> it just distracts my eye. There, that's better. Um, <laughs> it's a small thing. Um, and then I would look at Lepka, the painter. Right. Um, really look at how he commands his half tones in general. So um, we kind of went back and forth between the structural anatomy book, looking at Bouguereau, looking at Lipka. And then over here, you're in a whole new territory. Yeah. Um, I found hesitant. that on the internet. I found that on the internet last night. And it just, it gets funny how you said the face isn't important. Isn't important. And I just, I thought it was just cool. So I started working with my Conti pencils on uh, some of the paper you recommended. I guess it's Pascal paper. And yeah. it's, I got a really nice, I was just using a little white, a little black, like really nice, I was happy with it. Yeah, it's a, it's a nice, like it has a Matisse type of um, flattening. Yeah, that's exactly what I was feeling. Yeah. Um, and I don't know the artist, but um, what I would say, the one thing I would see right here, I always, um, they cut off the shoulder, right? Yeah. Um, I always make, when I'm, painting like a, a woman like that's kind of you know a pretty kind of like youthful woman uh the shoulders for me are always much more narrow than the um, yeah i had an issue with that i didn't pelvis. yes i knew it didn't look right to me and i would i probably go like and you could say well now you're not abiding by the drawing um well the drawing actually does i think it comes out a little bit further yeah. here and that's the way that they compensate for for this right here, where is it, it's a watercolor. By, by the way, it's a watercolor that you're looking at. Yep. So kind of like that. Right. And now the axis of the shoulder agrees, yep. uh, or that's the uh, width yeah, of the shoulder. Right. Yeah, I don't agrees. need to write. I don't need to put the hand. Do I need to put the arm in there at all? No, I I wouldn't. And I'd also cut the side of the rib cage a little bit. Um, I'd come in a little bit right there, and cut that in. And that that gives you so now the rib cage um, isn't isn't so wide left to right. Right. And the hips. This is a drawing about hips. Everything in the drawing is about yes. that right there. So. so cool. Very cool. Thank you. Yeah. Nice week. Um, let me do one last thing before I forget. I would like to pull up Lipka and send okay. Lipka over to you. Thank you. Um, is he still alive? Uh, is it, Lipka's yeah. still alive? Lipka's still going strong. I, I don't know how old he is as a painter, but he's still producing a body of work. Um, I don't, I gotta be honest, I don't really love his work because he does the erotica kind of like yeah. Um, yeah. thing in it. Like just a, a personal thing. It's like, I'm not saying that artwork can never have a sensuality, like read the Song of Solomon. And realize that. Um, oh yeah, <laughs> good example. Whoa. But it's like there's something almost exploitative, gratuitous um, about his work that doesn't click with me. I, I don't want to shut him off, but I look at him uh, for for studying, and I'm like, okay, there's someone who is is a consummate craftsman. <laughs> and well, really, you think about Egon Schiel. I mean, he was arrested, by the way. I don't know if you're aware. Yeah he was doing 12 year old 13 14 year old prostitutes in vienna and they rest they put him in jail for a little bit um, i didn't even know that i, I know yeah. next oh oh that man had a tough life he had a tough life I mean, you know, I know he did it 
he did him you know old nude portraits that are just you know they're out there and this is 1911 come on 1911 how tolerant yeah. was there i mean i i Shelley, like i I'm, I don't, I'm not drawn towards Shelley. i like klimt but Shelley, for me when i look at the work he it's it's for me it's almost like the birth of like the existential manifestation of existential philosophy yeah. where it's it's the beginning of meaninglessness in art i look at his work and i i think to myself he is successful in terms of his statement he conveyed what he wanted to convey yes absolutely but i just i find him the meaninglessness of of his line the quiver of his line it's it's a jarring calligraphy and again, like, I'm not saying he's not good. I'm saying he's fantastic, but I don't, his worldview is too dark for me. Like yeah. I, I don't like the neoclassical painters because their humanistic view of like man is, you know, determinant man is, you know, de determines all things. And, and it's all within our power to, <laughs> to understand and control. I kind of like the Baroque because it's mysterious and they're like, yeah, hey, listen. Well, you think about, yeah, you think about 1911, what was going on then and, Oh, that's some awful stuff. Awful, awful stuff. And and I yeah. yeah, that's where like I get it. And so but like I can't get into his work because I'm like I there's something there's something uh defeated. And I'm not saying again, I'm not saying he's a bad artist. I just it vexes me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it vexes me to like to the point of like being really upset where I'm more of a Tolstoy. Um, I know he's an author. Oh, the romantic but, door? Sure. But Tolstoy, like, he wrestled with the hardest questions in existence, like suicide. Why does a high society lady who has everything just suddenly jump on the train tracks? And he breaks it down for you, and he says, because people are selfish and don't be selfish. <laughs> That's right. And it's... Yeah, and it's, it's I understand. And I like that. I like that in my artwork, where there's something redemptive. Um, and Sheely never gives me that. And so I'm like, no, no. Yeah. well, that's his point of view. And it's his point his, of view. His personal yeah. life was a, it was a mess. It was just a mess. Clint was a sick puppy too. He was, oh, uh, I, didn't real, I didn't realize that. Oh yeah. He burned yeah. through women like other people burned through, uh, I don't know. Wow. <laughs> well, so. we know, we know the, uh, um, the woman, um, his famous woman was a, a Jewish woman, uh, her name was Bloch, Bloch, B L O C H. Uh, that was his. That was he who we draw. I actually, my brother-in-law's mother, who's now dead, lived to a hundred, knew the family. She knew. Oh, wow. She knew Sigmund Freud. I mean, wow. Vienna, Vienna, that time, and she knew, and she knew of the, and she knew of that family. They were awesome. very, very. They were wealthy. I mean, they were patrons of Flint. And yeah. Uh, yeah, the you know, the kiss. That that that's the woman in the kiss. That's the woman in the kiss. I didn't realize he was a. He, he had that extracurricular activity. Yeah, I mean, he was. I mean, he was so interesting because, like, the portrait of Adrian Blockbauer. Um, he he was part of that. Yeah, that Austrian set. It was they were Jewish patrons, and they were on the fore. They were the cutting edge, right, of of art. And we, were, were it not for their patronage, we wouldn't have the Austrian right. secessionists. We wouldn't. Yeah. And so, you, you know, Kevin, you know about the movie about recovering that that painting? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's quite. A, I, I forgot the name of it. Uh, I haven't um, seen it, but uh, Lady. Oh, it's great! It's great! Oh, it's great yeah. film. It's a great. It's a great. Just a persistent German lawyer, who yeah. took the case on. He was a, really a nobody at the bottom of the rung, and they sort of gave him the case because no one else wanted to take it. And he he did it. He got. He found it's a. The people around California, the, the relatives around California, and he, wow. he was able to retrieve the portrait. That's awesome. That's really cool. Yeah. yeah. And I, yeah, that's, I mean, there's something, it's interesting, like the artwork that I'm drawn to, you said before, whoever designed this thing, the team that designed the, uh, the Bursa. Um, right. And I'm an adherent to, uh, I, I like, I like uh, your, your author, David, and he says in the Psalms, we are fearfully and wonderfully made. And it was <laughs> this, it was this, un, it was a J Jewish understanding of the world that there was one creator and that he was loving and that he was, he designed things beautifully. And that's what, that's what that's I'm drawn to. to. As far as you have to go. That's as far yeah. as I have to go. And, but again, I get, I get Sheely, I get it. It's just, 
it repulses me on purpose. <laughs> it's like, by, by the way, before I let you go, can you, yeah. can you see this book? You know this guy? No, never hear. Never heard of oh, it. Oh, okay. Well, there's, there's something for you to write that. So I'm in the Holocaust Museum in, in uh, New York, and he oh. has a book. Mark, Call I do recognize it. Yes. His name is uh, the drawing. Coleman Aaron. You are I'm writing right. it down Coleman. right now. All right. Well, I'm going to show Aaron. you. Right. I think I recognize it. I could be wrong, but. Yeah, he was actually, he did Ronald Reagan's presidential portrait. Oh, wow. Okay. So. He was in a concentration camp. And of course, he did concentration of camp art, but he also he, he evolved into. I'll see if I can find the picture. He also did this. That's awesome. That's a beautiful yeah. piece. Yeah. You so I'm sure you can Google him. You'll see plenty of stuff. But what's interesting is there's some early. He was a protege at a young age. So he, he did some things in the concentration camp. I think it was 14 or 15 years of age. And that's and powerful. The, yeah, the book evolves it, he, and eventually he moves to California. And uh, just amazing, amazing guy. Here, I'm sending to you right now, Mark. I, I think I told you this. I was invited to uh, speak at the synagogue in Greenport. No, I didn't and, know that. Yeah, so. So um, uh, Saul invited me, and so I went in. It was funny because I recognized a few, uh, uh, two faces that they're they're in Hollywood. I don't know their role as directors and producers, but you see them right. at red carpet events. And they're there with low baseball caps. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, Spielberg, Spielberg, then, Spielberg lives out here. Yeah, I mean, he, I didn't, maybe he was there. But anyway, I didn't go up to anyone and say like, oh, oh. but uh, it was, the conversation was about Kristallnacht and. Um, oh, yeah and about all the artwork that was produced in the camps. And I had written a blog before, and then I wrote one after as well, but about um, the artwork that was produced in concentration camps. Um, no, there's a look at, out there. Yeah, take a look at, uh, I, my content isn't new and original as if I've exhumed something that has uh, <laughs> never been seen before, but I just kind of bring it to my reader's attention, the tremendous body of artwork that came out and the immortality of the artwork, like Dante said. Dante said, uh, writing was the way to achieve immortality because you can speak when you're gone. And so that was kind of the theme of what I spoke about uh, at the synagogue. It was a really cool night. Was, yeah, I bet they appreciate it. By, by the way, the, muse the Holocaust Museum in downtown, the Battery Park in New York, has got a mm -hmm. wonderful art library. Awesome. And I'd they like have all that. these artists that you're referring to. Plus, yeah. the Holocaust Museum itself is worthwhile seeing. Yeah. I'd when like you get it. when you get when you have the the uh, when you're brave enough to go into New York City, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. When I, when I get my spacesuit on, I'll, that's correct. <laughs> I'll, I'll bounce into it. <laughs> All right, so I'll see you in two weeks. See you in two weeks, Mark. Great lesson. All right, so I'm gonna do I'm gonna do feet. I'm gonna look at Lipke and uh, think about shadows. Thanks. Sounds Thank good. Great, yep. great session. Thanks, Kevin. Yeah, I'll send you the YouTube link in a little bit. Appreciate it. All right. Bye -bye. Bye -bye.